was a nightmare because you'd do a couple of them and you'd have no idea who was coming. You could open the door, no one would turn up. Your heart was in your mouth. Born in 1973 in Kent, Mark Knight has become a household name in the world of dance music. DJ, producer, songwriter, label owner, there isn't much he hasn't done in the world of dance music. I've got it because I love it. Mm -hmm. I genuinely love it from my heart and soul. DJing is about a psychology. How are we going to take this room with this amount of people in this environment from here to here? I know so many DJs that have just sold out for money. You're up there playing stuff that I know you don't like. Why? Why sell out music? Not everyone makes it. Of course they don't. That's the reality of life. You've got to be pretty good. You've got to come with your A game. But the door's wide open. Mm -hmm. Can you run through it? Can you make it happen? Happen. What's up, guys? Welcome back to First Things Thirst. Bit of a change of location. We are in sunny London, and I am joined with legendary house DJ Mark Knight. Hello, mate. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. A little bit chilly, but, you know, it's... Uh, Welcome to London. I'm, I'm doing all right. I've had three years of experience being in London, so I'm well accustomed to it. Acclimatised by now. Yeah. You, you're from London, right? I'm from Kent initially, but I, I live in town now. I've always kind of flitted between the two, but, um, mm. yeah, it's always been my home. This neck of the woods. Uh, and when did you actually get start getting into DJing? I guess um, early nineties, um, but you could rewind even further back from that. Um, like when I grew up in in the eighties, early eighties, uh, I was always obsessed with music. Before there was anything, DJing was a thing. Mm. I was just driven every Saturday to go and find and discover new music. So I guess if you want to go that far back, that it, that's really is the roots of DJing. It's that desire and that passion to find new music. And I was always planning to my friends, oh, have you heard this? And um, So I guess you could rewind all the way back to... Uh, I guess 1983, 1984, when I was, I was 10, I'd finish playing football on a Saturday and get the bus into town and <laughs> just go around all the record stores and discover new music. So I guess you could go that far back. And What, what was tr like trending back then? Because obviously I have no idea. I mean, even the, in the 90s, I was born in 1990. I, I, I think I really started getting into music when I was maybe like 11, 12. That's when I started to notice. I, I had like yeah. a, a passion for it. And similar to you, it wasn't just one specific type of music. I was into like loads of different genres. I just knew that when I listened to it, it made me feel good. Yeah, that's what yeah. music should do, you know. I guess we hadn't even invented the word trend in, it, in the mm -hmm. 80s. That, that didn't come to a lot later on. But I mean, I was very, very lucky because I've lived through two huge cultural uh, revolutions in music. The hip hop. Uh, hip hop in the late 70s and 80s and then dance music in the 90s. Um, and I was obsessed with hip hop and soul and funk and boogie um, from a super early age, I guess from the age of nine or 10, I'd, I'd sit by my mum's, my mum and dad had a little um, alarm clock by their bed with a radio and I'd be sat there tuning in, trying to find pirate radio stations and, and music that I loved and I had a tape cassette next to it, trying to record it that I could then go into town and say, oh, have you got this? And I know <laughs> we can't even hear it, but, um, Back then it was, yeah, it was electro, um, hip hop um, and soul and, and disco and all those kind of things that um, that first really drew me to music. Mm. And then it evolved into to house music later, but that was the roots of sort of my musical foundation. Uh, London's always been a pretty hot spot, like culturally for music, like all sorts of music. Always. I mean, everything happens here. And I'm going to say this um, with real belief, everything I think in youth culture starts here. I and mean, we're so lucky that it's such a melting pot of cultural influences and it has such an incredible energy, London. It really um, has all the right ingredients to be the catalyst for so many movements in, in culture and music. I guess, you know, America um, discovered hip hop and house but it all these things tend to take a real life here you know mm. and i'm so fortunate to have grown up here and be around this music and have access to this music um on my doorstep you know yeah. I, was, I was lucky really lucky what made you get into uh so like the actual house music well i didn't get house music first i'm not gonna lie it what was what was house music back then well, back like, it, did it I mean, even exist? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, no, I mean, I guess the earliest thing, you know, the earliest sort of house record I remember hearing um, was probably Nitro Deluxe, Let's Get Brutal, which I think coming about 87, I'm going to say. And that was a kind of fusion of electro. I mean, it was electronically programmed, you know, since were the leads. Um, but that was the first kind of iterations of house music. That was where it kind of grew from. It was an amalgamation of disco and electro fused mm. together, the tempo of, ele uh, of disco and some of the instrumentation and um, melodies, and then the tech of electro. That was, I guess, the, the roots of how it began um, and just experimenting with, with technology um, that, that was born in, in the late 80s when you started to have drum machines and MIDI um, and all this access to new sounds. Mm. Um, yeah, cause it was, you, like it's not like today when you have all these uh, software platforms that you can use to actually like create music. I guess you were a lot limited by well, you, you know, let's rewind to the seventies. You never had that. You had organic instruments. You had a piano. You had a guitar. Then all of a sudden, you had all this incredible musicianship and all these new sounds. All these new sounds you'd never heard before. All these sounds you could manipulate and create from scratch. Hmm. And it was just so inspiring. Um, and so evolutionary in, uh, around that time that all these things were bl blowing up. You could take music to all these new places that had never happened before. So to grow up and be amongst that was so inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess really nailed on my my passion to want to progress in music, I guess. Did you, did you start DJing or producing? Well, like I say, um, DJing was never a thing as such back then. Um, as I started to get more into house, I bought a set of decks. I mean, I guess the thing that really drove me uh, to be... Is this Pioneer decks or is it a different brand? Oh, way back in the day, <laughs> they were just um, the crappy belt-driven decks. You know, they weren't Technics. They were just, you know, whatever we could afford, um, which was a great grounding, really, because if you could mix on those, which took a whole lot of jiggling and, uh, <laughs> and it was a very tactile experience. If you could make it work on then, on that, that equipment... You know, you had skills, and they were, you know, the better the equipment got, the easier it become, yeah. the better you could become. So, um, I was very much driven by my brother, who who actually learned to DJ first, and we're so competitive. Um, we always have been, and we we still run the label together now. And he's like, "Oh, I can DJ, I can do." I'm like, "What? <laughs> right, that's it." Now, I'm now you know, I, I being the older brother as well, and already you know buying music before him, I thought, "Well, oh, this can't happen." So mm. that kind of uh, that drove me to to hone my skills technically in, in terms of being a DJ. Um, that was around ninety one, ninety two, around that sort of time. Um, and it progressed from there on. Were you, were you able to make any money out of it to begin with, or was it just purely a hobby? It purely a hobby, um, and that's how you know it should really be f fundamentally yeah. underpinned with that as a as an ethos to do it because you absolutely love it. You know, money's a by byproduct. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that sentiment has got distorted and lost nowadays. I guess when you see people jumping off, you know, often on private planes and living this kind of high rolling life stuff off the back of it you know you need to rewind it all the way back to being to go this just should be about a love for music i never got into dating because i wanted money mm. no chance there was there was no money it was just a pure passion to play music to people that you love to express yourself or what express yourself through the medium of playing music no yeah. Because I needed money, I had a job. I had, well, I had to go to work. And then, what was your job before you doing well, this full time? When I left school, I was in construction, um, and that was always the plan. Well, that and football, I always wanted to be a professional footballer, but um, it didn't quite happen. That was always the, that was always the game plan. But um, going out, girls, and a whole bunch of other things <laughs> turned up, and you know, yeah, getting hard. It was getting harder and harder to turn up to football on Sunday morning. Um, so. Yeah, that didn't quite happen. So I was, you know, I was in construction as well at the same time and I was making, and then started to make a bit of music and get some gigs locally. Mm -hmm. um, and it sort of progressed from there, really. But I, um, think, I think that's probably the, the hardest part when you start off actually finding places to get gigs at. Like absolutely. How, I'm trying to imagine me, if I, if I was starting DJing, 
How would I go about trying to get those first few gigs? You have to generate your own audience. That's what it's all about. Um, it's about going to a venue and say, look, I will bring you X amount of people. Mm -hmm. It's that organic initial swell that gives you that momentum to start. And it's about rallying all your friends. Back then, we, this yeah, because how do you do that before social media? Before social, uh, flyers. You'd have to go around with word of mouth telling people. We used to go around to clubs after us and put flyers on people's windscreen <laughs> mate it was old school but there was a, a, a charm and a and a passion about that i mean it was a nightmare because you'd do a club event you'd had no idea who was coming mm. if any you could open the door no one would turn up your heart was in your mouth yeah, was i was gonna say like there was no pre-sales you're blagging no... it to the, the club it was just like fingers crossed it's a work but it was about about building your own audience initially i mean a lot of that was your friends getting your friends down there to help support you they tell a friend, it's a successful night, it goes well, and it kind of ripples out, and it grows from from that way. But I remember my first ever gig was um, on a Tuesday night in a pub in Maidstone. That's where it started. It was, uh, <laughs> how many people? Five. <laughs> but that's where you learn how to DJ. Yeah, because yeah. look, anyone can play to 5,000 people because they're not going anywhere. They've all yeah. bought a ticket for 50 quid. They're probably off their nut as well. You're not going anywhere. Yeah. Play to five people, get one record wrong, they're going, they're mm -hmm. going home. So that's in some ways, they're the best environments to learn because it really teaches you, to, teaches you to think about how you play music and the progression of it and not playing things that jar with the, the, the situation you're in. So all of those tiny little gigs playing to no one was really the best training, the best foundation I could have for my career because I can always mm -hmm. go back to that and you see a lot of these kids now who stratospherically kind of get propelled into this this realm of stardom yeah. but have none of that grounding. So they don't know how to to really manipulate and work a crowd from nothing. I mean, I love playing gigs where I start and I play open to close. I play the whole night. So you start with no, the first person walks in the door to everyone leaves and you build that um, story. You, 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 you kind of grow it over the night in line with the energy of the room. Mm -hmm. And that's what DJing's about. Yeah. You know, DJing is about rocking up for an hour playing all the hits. My mum can do that. Yeah. I could teach my mum to do that in an hour. It's, but, it's interesting because a, a lot of comedians <coughs> do that. The comedians actually like to go and play in the smaller clubs so they can refine and practice their skills. You feel, you know, it, DJing is about a psychology. It's about yeah. going into a room and going, okay, the vibe of the room is here. And what I want it to be is here. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to take this room with this amount of people in this environment from here to here without it, without, with it feeling completely effortless, without mm -hmm. anything jarring, no, no peaks and troughs in energy, this smooth ride musically to the point of where I want it to be. Mm -hmm. And that's what DJ is about. And in those small rooms, it's hard, easier to get that personal connection. When you're in a massive warehouse, you lose touch of that because mm -hmm. you're initially there's a disconnect in, in in um in that relationship because they are behind a barrier 30 feet away so how am i supposed to connect with that mm -hmm. how am i supposed to connect and especially in this day and age where people look at you like i still can't quite get my head around that i'm like why are you looking at me <laughs> like, hang on, what's, hang on, hang on. <laughs> it's like you should be just listening to the music when i went out as a kid we weren't interested in looking at some geezer to be on the decks. We went out to look at girls and dance, you yeah. know? And that, again, that bit's, I think, got a bit distorted and lost in the, the kind of evolution of electronic music. I think it needs to be more about, don't worry about what the DJ is. You don't need a cue for fun. You don't need to look at me to say, right, I'm going to put my hands up and everyone have fun. Mm -hmm. Like, you should be lost in the environment that you're in and the music you're in you don't need a prompt from me but mm. it's turned into that and that's the game we play but yeah i still find that a bit weird it is i mean i i remember when i started going to clubs and particularly the first few times i went to ibiza i was i think i was like 17 18 years old and i had some some old footage on a digital camera which i had because obviously phones didn't have videos yeah. then and i was watching them the other day and there is nobody holding a phone there was no such thing. Nobody, yeah. like everybody's like properly just like in the zone and just with everybody else. Yeah. And, and the sad thing is, I'd, we're probably never going to go back to that. It's such a shame. I know I, I have this conversation a lot. I mean, all the best memories are in your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, no one's ever, oh, let me just get out the phone and dial back to 2012. No one said that ever. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So if we could lose that and just be in the moment. Mm hmm that would make 
things great again. I really believe that because we had so many brilliant times. I haven't got a single photo to back that up. <laughs> that statement. Not one. The one doesn't, eat, thank God, to be fair, for legal <laughs> reasons. But, um, uh, but they're all the best nights you ever had and they're all there, you know, and yeah. I think... Um, we need to shift culture and, and, and trends away from being so dependent on on that. And, you know, so I'm almost under pressure to to, to portray what you're doing and where you are. Just be in the moment. Mm. Cause it's so much better. I think the only way they could really do that is if, like, on, on entry, you have to put your phone away. Yeah, I mean, there are clubs, that, I know in Germany, that have that as a policy. Oh, is that the, um, yeah, you, what's it called? The high, high, I, I, I'm not sure the name, but that's such a great idea yeah. because honestly, the, back in the day, I know, I guess everyone looks at things retrospectively through sort of rose uh, tainted spectacles, but they were brilliant times. They mm. were brilliant because you had to be in it. There was no second chance. There was no replays. You mm. were in the moment, you know, Um and it's a shame we've kind of lost that, that as a as a as a thing. Yeah, going back to when you 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 say in your DJing, I've always been fascinated by how you can you have that ability to manipulate the crowd. So, tell me a bit more about how you change their their energy. Like you said, you wanted to get from like where they are now to this point, which yeah. you want to get them to. How do you go about doing that? Like, what what's going through your mind when you're thinking about okay? I'm going to play this track next and then this track next. How does it work? It's about knowing your music and the energy related to that record. And if you put them in a sequence, what what story does that tell over a, a time span? Now, if you're trying to do, if you're playing, let's say you're playing an eight hour set, you've got to know enough music that's relevant for hour one, hour two, hour three, hour four, and that they all join mm. up. Like to give you an example, let's say you're at a disco like a wedding and someone's DJ and everyone's dancing about and then the DJ puts the wrong record and oh <laughs> even your nan sat down even <laughs> your nan's not feeling the bar but it's killed her buzz you know so that that that's a kind of a, a very extreme example of it but it's about knowing your music inside out so you don't get that mm -hmm. as an outcome you get a natural progression um, and you need to know when to to ramp it up back it off a bit because if you go on 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 all the time mm. people are like, I'm worn out yeah, it's too, yeah, much, yeah. It's too much. It's too much energy. If it's not enough yeah, energy, to be like the, the the high track and then like maybe like low and then back to the yeah, high. Yeah, you have to. Know, there's, and there's sometimes you need to flip it and take you know take them out of a certain groove. But it's all that psychology of just being connected to the room, knowing okay, I can push the envelope for this long because I can. You know, you're looking around, you feel people's energy. Mm -hmm. It's all about that. You know, it's about just picking up on that understanding. Um, where you think they're at. And that just comes through experience. You know, you can't teach anyone that. Yeah. It goes back to the days of playing on a Tuesday night in Maidstone uh, where there's five people in there going, all right, I need to think about every single record here. I can't make one mistake because otherwise I'm playing to the bartender. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to that that basic premise of just understanding your records, picking and choosing them so you create this seamless flow of energy. Do, do you have all these tracks in your head or do you, is it all like organized in the... Because I've seen DJ they have like the the I don't know if they still have that but well, they had a booklet of like yeah I mean we don't use CDs so much now but you have playlists within um, uh, CDJs that you can kind of organise into a flow and you know I do that it makes sense you know what I mean it's it's too much to be in that high pressured environment and be prepared to fully understand every, you know, know every single record mm -hmm. so I put them into different hours I, I put them into like hour one hour two hour three and I know that they're r relative to the energy. If I'm playing a two hour set, I've got like a, a two hour, two or three hours of stuff that's relevant, that's new. Some of, a lot of my records in there for some classics that people want to come and hear yeah, me yeah. play. Um, things that are not out, so that it placates people that want to come and hear brand new unreleased mm. music. So you have to kind of get all that balance and have it in an order that makes sense as a story. Because the story has to have a start, a middle and an end. Yeah, you know, like every I mean, every great concert you go to, you know, normal starts. You don't go see you two and they do with or without you the first. You're like, oh, we're gonna go now. Then. <laughs> You've done it. Right, see ya. You know yeah. that you you work to that point. It's the finale of the set, so you program it um, accordingly that it tells a story 
pro rata to the to length of the set you're playing. Very quickly, guys, I want to give a special shout out to the official sponsor of the podcast, The Digital Playbook. This is something which I was working very hard upon towards the end of last year, and I'm happy to announce it is now finally available. This is something which I wish I had years ago when I was working as a personal trainer stuck inside of a gym, and all I really wanted to do was travel the world and make money online. It'll teach you how to turn your passion, skill set, and hobby into an online money-making machine that will give you all the financial and geographical freedom that you have always wanted. All the lessons which I've learned, all the mistakes which I've made, all the experience which I have gained, which has led me up to this point in time right now, is all inside of it. And of course, there's a private community full of like-minded individuals like myself who will be there to help each other and motivate you along your way. So if it sounds like something you're interested in, head over to the digitalplaybook.net and I'll see you on the inside. Did, did you ever play tracks that you hate, but you know it's going to get the crowd hype? No, no, <laughs> never, ever, 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 ever. I don't, you know, like I said to you, I didn't get into music for money. I got in it because I love it. Mm -hmm. I genuinely love it from my heart and soul. Um, so you couldn't pay me enough money to go and play something I didn't like. And that notion, I know so many DJs that have, and I'm going to call it, have just sold out for money. And yeah. I know... You're up there playing stuff that I know you don't like. Mm. Yes, you're getting paid ridiculous amounts of money, but like, why? Why sell out music? That's like got to be the worst crime in the world, right? Mm. You know, if you want to go and earn money, go go into banking or go into something where you don't have that kind of moral um, yeah. situation. Like, I could have gone on a lot, lot, lot further in my career, been a lot bigger than what I am. But I couldn't sell myself out and sell music out. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I, I still, I, you know, I don't go hungry. I live a great life. And I can stand behind everything I've done and tell my grandkids I did things that I believe in and I did it from my heart. And what more do I need to say? Mm. Do you know what I mean? That's, that, that's it. Full stop. Yeah, cause I, I remember I, I went to Tomorrowland, I think it was in 2019. And on the main stage, I mean, that's where they're playing to tens of thousands of people yeah there's a, there's a lot of people and the music they play is a bit like i mean let's just say it's not my type of music but these djs are getting paid i mean i don't know if they're they enjoy playing that music or not but they're getting paid like crazy amounts of money to do yeah. so and look I, there are when you go into bigger settings obviously you've got more crowd less you know less chance of everyone being completely it's gonna be like mainstream it's, isn't it? yeah so look i guess i get bending things to accommodate the situation. But when you kind of go off into a realm of doing things that doesn't come from the heart, then I, I don't understand it. I don't get it. I, mm. Maybe I come from an era that was pre all of this. You know, we, you know, there were no DJ courses. There were no, you know, now it's, it's a full on trade profession. It was just a love. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm still rooted in that element of how I see it. So I don't get well, that. I, I respect that. Thank it's, you. No, it's, that's, that's, it's the only way to be, surely, right? Mm. Do you uh, do you recall a point in your career where you thought, oh, "Fucking hell, like I've I've made it here"? No, or has it been? No, not really. Quite sort of no, gradual. Yeah, it's been. I mean, I guess that's why I've had the career I've had because it's never gone up like that. It's always been this just general ascent to and, and the thing I hate doing in life is going backwards mm. like I, I can't go backwards i can't like I, it kills me to do anything backwards it can be small steps but always forward um and i've never had this huge hit that's kind of gone like this but usually off the back of that you come straight down like this yeah it don't so, be one hit wonder no yeah. i mean having a hit is is a big burden to carry because the expectation gonna, is so high we're gonna do next you know <laughs> yeah. what i mean it's all good doing it once, but can you do it again? Can you do it again? And I've done things that, you know, I love um, that sometimes connect on, on a on a very big scale and sometimes just allow me to kind of progressively move forward in steps that don't go backwards, but just continually go up and up and up mm. and up. And um, yeah, I've, I've kind of had the career over that period because I've not had these huge peaks and troughs in my career and you know 25 years later still doing still you know with that at the top of my game I think what what I made do. you stand out to me or when i realized who you were i think it was when man with the red face came out because this was this was when i was at university i think it was second year of university was it 2009 
eight, yeah. 2008, 2009. 2009. So every, I was going out a lot. This was in Newcastle. Right. So every time I went out, there was always a guarantee that that song was going to get played at least once. And every time it came on, like me and my friends always got like really hyped because oh, it, it never, it never thanks, got old. Like it was such a <laughs> sick track. Oh, thank you. I mean, I guess that was, you know, that's been my biggest record in my career. And, and Bigger it, than Downpipe? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Because it kind of crossed over to a mainstream audience, but without having a mainstream approach. And that's the sweet spot. If you can do that, um, then you really win on every level. Mm. Um, Downpipe is, uh, and thank you for, for bringing up, is a, is a headsy record, you know, and if you know, you know. Um, that's, to me, that's like proper house. Thank like, you. Like gets me in a good, like anytime I want to go out, I always used to listen. That would be like one of the songs that was in the playlist. Oh, nice one. Thanks, man. I mean, yeah, that took, that took a long time to get right that. Took nearly a year to get that record right. I remember what because of the the vocals or the just the whole production and just the pressure like if you're going to work with underworld mate you've got to come correct you can't not can't get nearly right you've got to nail it and i remember playing at um amnesia uh in uh for cream in ibiza and i played it for the first time and i kid you not mike it cleared the dance floor i was like oh shit what have i done here i made a record with underworld and it's cleared the dance floor um, really? Yeah, it did. Because it's different. It had, it's kind of a very progressive arrangement. It's a very clever record. It sort of tells a story over eight minutes. Um, it wasn't quite right, so we refined it before. Do you know what? I'm going to stick with it. I know this record's right. You might not get it straight away. And now, in 2024, we're still talking about it. Mm. And it's because we sort of stuck to our guns, go, do you know what? The idea of this is right, and it's not an instant thing. It's a grower, and it creeps up on you. But those are the ones that last the test, you know, mm. the test of time. So, um, I, I was always curious to know, like, you know, <coughs> man, you man with the red face, like the guy who's playing the sax. Yeah, how that seems like it's, it was the perfect way, or whatever, or whatever you would call it, that segment of sax. Yeah, like it, I don't think it could have got better. Like, how many times did it take for him just to be like improvising? Well, that's not one take. So what what we did, but when you get someone in like that who's going to give you a solo or something. You get them to jam. So you don't it, tell them, you just say, just do your yeah, thing. Yeah, we say, look, we just need a, we need a, uh, you know, a 16 bar jam here that, that leads into a crescendo, the bit at the end. So he'll do four or five takes and then we'll just cut up all the bits. <coughs> Excuse me. And, shall I do that again? <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, he'll do about four or five takes and then we'll cut it together to get the perfect um, mm -hmm. melodic flow. Um, so... James is brilliant. The guy James and I did, and I love him to bits. But yeah, that was about four or five takes. Some incredible. Look, if he didn't come up with all the magic, we couldn't have pieced it together. But mm -hmm. generally, a lot of those things are an amalgamation of different takes produced by us to tell that, mm -hmm. to that little bit of a, to make that phrase. So um, it must be such a good feeling, you know, when you've you've got the final version. And you're like, it's fucking done. And this is going to... Well, I guess you never really know how it's going to be received. No, you don't. But no, I mean, you've got an indication based on experience, yeah. But sometimes you're like, holy shit, I wasn't expecting but that. Did you ever get sick of it because you've heard it so many times? Because I know when... Mate, even if sometimes, I had a pound and for every time I played for that, I'll go... Yeah. But whenever, cause whenever I used to... I used to edit my own videos and I would have... I would pick a particular song and I was trying to get it right, like the edit. And yep. that song was repeating over and over and over again to the point where I started to hate the song. Yeah. I think when you're making a record, if the idea is super strong and that's the fundamental, that's the the main essence of it, getting the idea right. If you get the idea right, it'll come together in about three or four hours mm -hmm. because the idea is strong. If you've got to try and engineer it into a product, then it's not the right idea. Mm. You know, if you've got to kind of crowbar parts into a record to make them fit, you've got the wrong parts. Yeah. You've got the wrong, it's not the right idea. Stop. And then work, move to something else. So, yeah, there are times back in the early days where the ideas weren't strong enough. That you'd spend ages, but I think, oh, I hate this. But the more experienced you get, the more confident you are, and the quicker the process is because you're going in with a stronger idea. I go, I know this idea is going to work. Mm -hmm. It's this, 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 and it's done. How, how do you get the ideas? Like, do you just think, oh, yeah, I have an idea to do this track. Like, maybe it's 
at night when you're lying in bed or maybe after you've done a set and you're like, oh. All of the above, all of that, yeah. Sometimes you'll play and you'll hear something and you're mixing two records. You go, hang on, that's an idea. Or you hear someone else play something. Oh, that's an idea. You, you know, inspiration it never switches off. Mm. You're constantly, I'm constantly inspired by everything. I'll be in a, in a taxi, someone's playing something on the radio. Oh, I'm constantly on Shazam. You just hear like little all noises. All the time I hear something, oh, that's a good idea. That's a good uh. shout. Or oh, that's a good idea for a record. So, yeah, that, that, that element never ever switches off. I'm always, my brain is always on for inspiration. And I, I mean, touch wood, I've never run out of ideas. I've mm. never had writer's block. I've, you know, I just haven't got enough. There's not enough release slots in a year to get all the ideas out yeah. that I could write. You know, in some ways it sort of stifles me because you're like, I could do 50 tracks, you know, I could do 100 tracks. So it just on and on and on. Yeah, I'm like, just very lucky to. How do you find the balance between being in the studio producing versus going out and about being the DJ? Well, I, I, I mean, it's I have to juggle a lot of things. I'm obviously, I'm a, a DJ, I'm a producer, I've got a big record label. Um, I tend to have about three or four days a month to write music and that's it. Um, because I'm so quick at doing it and I know... You just I'll, go into the studio and then... Bang, do it in a day, mm. done. And then I'll bro test it and I make tweaks, but... It doesn't take me any longer than that. Okay. If, if it does, it's not quite right. Um, I mean, I suppose it, over the time, I make it getting the initial idea to a place where I can go and play it one day, and then there'll be three or four hours worth of tweaks. But that's come through twenty-five years worth of experience. I mean, some things take a little. If you've got to use a lot of musicians, just the process of recording it, editing vocals, that can take a bit longer. But if I was just to do a straight club record. Yeah, day. So I, I maybe only take one or two, about three days a month in the studio. The rest of the time it's running the business, to be honest. That, yeah. that is the biggest element of my of, of my week, of my month, it yeah. is that. Because I'm, I'm, I spend more time working on other people's music than I do my own. I spend a lot of time on ad prod, on the music that we sign. That consumes most of my energy. Most yeah. of my energy is given on other people's work to build the profile and the success of Tool Room. Mm. So how did Tool Room Records come about? Well, it was born really um, out of the experiences I'd have releasing music on other people's labels. And I just felt really let down by the whole process. Mm -hmm. I was like, these people couldn't run a bath, let alone a record label. You know? <laughs> and I, I could do this better. And I had no idea mm. how to, there was no, here's how you start a record label, volume one, the book, you know, you just we just made it up. Um, but I believed in what I wanted to say musically. I had an identity, and I think fundamentally that's key, is to know what you stand for. That's yeah, the secret yeah. of success. In any type of music, is to stand behind what you are and just stick with it. You know, if you believe in something, you do it with pure transparency and love, you'll always be doing the right thing, because mm. that says you. Um, if you try to copy things or, or you know, follow trend, that's when it begins to go wrong. So it was born out of an idea that I had to to own the process, really, because um, I felt that if I'm going to be successful here, I can't leave my career in the hands of other yeah. people. I need to take ownership of this because if it goes wrong, it's only me to blame. Mm -hmm. I, I look inwardly, you know, I can't blame if things don't happen, then it's down to me to work harder, work smarter, whatever it needs to be. If I need to get through that wall, then I'll better start running. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to let someone else, no one's going to do it for me. So I better own the process. So I realized early on, that I knew what I wanted to stand for. I knew if I built the right team around me that I could, I could say something, I could really say something. Um, and the stars aligned very early. My brother who was working as a car salesman at the time, lost his job. And I said, come on sure this this start a record label and my dad had just retired at the time as well um did he like music as well well he'd been in music as well i mean uh, uh when he left school he was a drummer and he was in a band and they toured and they were quite successful so he'd been in the music business he was an artist he went on into other businesses and did what and, and music was a long time ago but he was always passionate about music he'd been in the scene there you know loosely so he'd un he understood how it worked a little bit and he had a real passion for it. So we sat, sat down and I said, look, Dad, I want to start a record label. Can you give us some you know, help? And he brought a different perspective to it. You know, We were very close to the business um, in terms of the passion for the specifics and nuances of what we wanted to achieve. But 
he brought the business acumen to it. It's like, mm. look, we could be selling washing machines here, lads. The fact we're selling music is somewhat irrespective. We need to apply certain principles to the way we apply ourselves to how we do business if we want to be successful and have longevity. So we underpinned it and all the right business uh, acumen. Um, and I think if you get those two factors right, if you have a passion uh, and creativity and you marry that with great business principles, you've got a good chance of winning. Mm -hmm. And we had all of those things. Um, and we stuck to a plan. We wrote out a five-year plan initially and we were hemorrhaging money left, right and centre. <laughs> but we believed in it. We believe, We never, ever gave up. In fact, I don't think we made any money for 13 years. Everywhere, anything we made, we piled back yeah, into yeah, investing. Yeah into the business, into premises, into more staff, more and more staff. You know, we had 40-odd staff at one time. I think we're still at 33 now. Um, but we, you know, we believed in it wholeheartedly and we stuck to what mm -hmm. our initial vision was. Um, it was born out of a shed that's on my parents' house. That's why it's called Tool Room. <laughs> it's where we used to keep the lawnmower and, the, and, um, and all the garden tools. It, yeah, the tool room. It was just a brick building outside my mum and dad's mm -hmm. house. And... Uh, I, I was at work and I was doing a little bit of DJing and I had, I had a flat in town and um, I said to my wife, look, I want to take the plunge and go full time and start this label and just throw everything at it. You know, mm -hmm. I've got one chance. I'm at the point in my life where I've got nothing to lose. So we sold the flat and every penny I had, I ploughed into, into this business and I built a studio inside the tool room. So we said, well, what are we going to call it? And I said, well, I guess the soul of this business is this room so let's call it tool room. It's a very <laughs> personable thing to to our family. All that's only a shed, um, and that was the uh, that was how it began, and that was that's the name behind the story. What what is the role of a record label? Because I'm trying to imagine if I'm a DJ, I've just created a track. <coughs> yep. Like you can't just release the track. You you do you have to have it on a label, and then the label has a responsibility to push it out there correct yeah in, in, in its ba most basic form that's right we are what we do is we find talent we find music we work on bringing that music to be the best it possibly can be with if we need you know advice extra production to taking that product to the best product it can possibly be then we create a marketing plan around that record how do we give that record exposure how do we um, get eyes and ears on on the product so we come up with marketing plans specific to that record um, and then we deliver it to all the DSPs or the Spotify mm. and Apple and so on and so forth um, and then we continue to update them so and then we, we've got the events business we get we look after the, the, the artists with shows so we're like a kind of 360 um, ecosystem around an artist to help support them so they can concentrate on being artistic we can look after the the business aspect of yeah. uh, you know because it's called the music business for a reason it's not all music and it's not all business you have to have you know both facets well and truly well placated for it to really mm -hmm. to work and be on songs so we look after the business side of it um and then we pay people we look after people we make sure that they generate money through every possible um option in music now because technology and is just evolving constantly and the opportunities to exploit music are ever changing mm. you know for example peloton is one of our biggest clients it's supplying cool. music to peloton for their what's peloton peloton you know on the bike all oh, right the, yeah. the, you know you got the screen and you I, oh Pel the you exercise know. thing yeah I should know that. <laughs> yeah. So that, I mean, but that's how music's evolving. It's about being yeah. across all of these new opportunities. Like TikTok now. Yeah. I mean, all of these things need, all of these platforms need music or they mm. need product. Um, and we need to be across that. We need to make sure we've got our, mm. our product there. We're shouting very loudly that you should listen to our stuff. So that's in, in, in the ba most basic form, the role of, of, a, of a label. Mm -hmm. Um, and there is a big difference, you know, between a record label and a record company. Look, we could start a record label now. Go, right, let's call it Cushion Record Label. We're off and running, science music. Up, but to have a record company with staff and expertise yeah, yeah. is a different entity. And we're very much a record company and we're, we're, we're super at the top of our game. Well, we're, last last year, 2023, on Beatport, you were the... The number one label, yeah. I think we've been for years and years that, you know, it's it, it's great. We're 20, we celebrate 20 years. And it was a nice little nod to say hey we're still top of our game mm -hmm. 20 years later who was one of the 
the best signings that you made as a company? Um, I guess that varies really. You know, people we've we've worked with over a long period of time. Um, we've signed some big superstars. We've done records from anywhere from Coldplay to David Guetta, right the way through to you know kids out their bedroom. Mm -hmm. There are no rules. There's, there, it's, we don't A and R with our eyes. We A and R with our ears. And it's about it doesn't matter where you come from and who you are. There's, there's no specific genre because no, there's that we, we set, there's a specific genre musically, but in terms of artistically, yes, yeah. it helps if you're David yeah. Gare. Of course, it does. Mm -hmm. But if you're Johnny Smith in your bedroom and you come out with a banger, you you come up yeah. with a banger. Yeah. We look, you know, we're the home of bangers, and that that's that's that underpins everything we do is is finding that the right music, you know, within a specific sound. Because again, as I said earlier, it's about knowing what you stand for that people go to your music your go to um without even always listening to it mm. when we used to have record shops you used to have certain labels you'd go in there and you'd see the new the label would be the artwork you'd see the vinyl and i'll have another one then do you want to hear it no it's cool i know it's gonna be great i'll just take it yeah. and it's getting to that point where people trust you that much they see the new pack shot and go, i'll have that new tour room release we'll have that yeah and that's you know a, a consistency of sound and and quality over a period of time. Did you, did is, do you find talent, or does the talent come to you? Like, do they submit their songs to Tool Room, or is it Tool Room's job to actually go find new people? Both, both. You know, yeah. it's, it's a it's a scouting process all the time. Um, one thing we have developed in the last eight years is we have our own uh, academy, which is an educational business and a kind of training ground, much in line with the academy system in football. That was the initial idea. You know, mm -hmm. I've come through that and understood that process really well mm -hmm. and thought, look, we can replicate this in music because it's a kind of win for all. We can teach you the real specifics of making our sound. It's not a generalised music production. Because, look, listen, you go on YouTube and everything you want to know is there for free. Yeah. Crack on. Now, if you want to learn the specifics of making the sound of Tool Room, we can give you all the inside intel on how to do so. And you're taught by artists that have had real bona fide high-end careers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a bit like going to a football training camp, go, right, today we're doing shooting with Pele, you know. It's it's a bit different to logging on to YouTube. We've, had, we've got artists like Dean Ramirez, who, you know, who I wrote Downpipe with, teaching you how to make the specifics of our sound. So you're learning from the very, very best. You create a relationship with us. There's a direct conduit between what you're doing and the record label. And if you're good, if you're good enough, we'll sign you and mm -hmm. you're on the label. And if you're not, at least you've learned from the best of the best. So it's a great model that feeds into the ecosystem of how we, we find artists. You know, look, I, not everyone makes it. Of course they don't. That's, that's the reality of life. I mean, you look at... The football academy system, it's 1% of the 1% that make it. Mm. And it's a bit like that in music. I'm not going to lie. You, you've got to be pretty good. You've got to come with your A game. But the door's wide open. Mm -hmm. Can you run through it? Can you make it happen? Uh, and we'll give you all the tools to at least try. So that's a big part of our, our scouting uh, process. Of course, we have artists globally that we're in f friends with that are, make the sound of what we do. We have relationships. We put them in recording contracts. So... It, it's a kind of multi multifaceted approach to how we get music, um, but we need to be across all of it if we want yeah. to be the best of the best. How does it make money? Um, through, I mean, through downloads, through um, neighbouring rights. That there's so many different op options now to to ge generate money, mm. you, and you've got to be across all of it. It's a tough market because not only is the ticket price very low like for example if you stream a record on spotify you get 0 0.02 yeah. pence for every stream now you've got to do a lot of streams <laughs> to make any money yeah. but that doesn't say it doesn't mean to say you can't you just got to have great music and what, you've got to have what, a lot what, of what happens when you download a song you get the money you get the, the sale of that you make more because, money via that because I, I download the majority of the songs i listen to on my iphone yeah but then it technically no longer no longer becomes a stream does it? No, no. Then you you bought it. Then you own it. That's your that's your copy if, of if, the record. So and then we. Get, but I've not bought it. Though. I've just downloaded it. Ah, now like if I've downloaded something on. Well, Spotify. it depends where you've downloaded it from. See, that's that's the challenge we face because I would say 
conservatively, we're working on the basis of every record we one record we sell. Let's say a thousand are downloaded equal uh, um, illegally. Now, let's say we open the jean shop. So if I can open the jean shop, for every pair of jeans we sell, someone's going to come in the shop and nick a thousand pairs. You know? Well, this is you from like that, you, the torrent the size, like Pirate Bay. All of that thing. You're working, you're running. It's very, very tough. I mean, when things went guys, digital... don't do it, guys. You don't buy yeah, them, If right? you're listening at home, <laughs> cut it out. Um, so it, it's tough. You're running uphill and you've got to run fast. Mm. But... I think with the 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 growth of of uh, Spotify and Apple and, and Deezer and all these sites now, and music becoming more affordable and more well organised. You know, if you subscribe to Spotify, you've got everything. Well, I've got I've got my own playlist. I've got um, there's an Ibiza playlist which has, got, I think it's got like where is it like fifty thousand followers on it. Yeah, you, you got ten of your songs on there. Oh, thanks, mate. Well, there you go. You put it back. Love that, Mike. <laughs> Um, but that there is you know now we've shifted to um to that model that people know well if i pay 10 pound a month i can have every record ever made mm. i mean as a kid growing up that would be like the biggest dream ever yeah. i mean we'd, i pay 10 pound for one record let alone every record ever made yeah. um but still not everyone's there it's still a long way mm. um before we go back to the heady days of a physical product where there were no pirated music, you know. We made a lot. Well, it was just pre tour room, so unfortunately, we just missed that heyday. Mm. But you know, when you're selling a, C a CD or um, a, a vinyl for eighteen pounds, you're making a lot of money, <laughs> yeah. and that's the only way of consuming it. When they were saying millions and millions of albums at twenty pound, it's a lot of money. Yeah. But unfortunately, we're in a different landscape now. It's great that people can now have access to it. That needs to be married with mm -hmm. a conscience to, to support music, to give it longevity. But most, most of the DJs, they're buying songs from people. people. That's like the main one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not everyone does still. People, you know, people sharing music, people still buying, downloading it from illegal sites. And I'd feel pretty bad if I was a big time DJ and I I'd feel, support my mate. <laughs> I'd feel very bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think if you've got a conscience and you want this scene to be as best as it can, it's about putting back. You know, mm. I, I'd never, I've never, I can hand on my heart, so I've never downloaded an illegal piece of music. Why would I, you know, I love this scene. I love it. I mm. want it to grow and continue. Why would I, why would I rob it? So, and it's not that expensive to buy something from people. Now it's a pound. I mean, come on. Yeah. I mean, the amount of work that goes and love and passion that goes in to making that piece of music. If you can't spend a pound, Maybe you should be, you know, yeah. thinking about something else. Which track made you the most money on um, Beatport? On Beatport, I mean, Red Face made us a lot of money on Beatport. Um, you split that 50-50 and the bit to the sax man. Uh, that, <laughs> James gets a lot of gigs out of that. Um, <laughs> we, yeah, we made a lot of money out of that. That was pre-streaming. I mean, streaming makes us a lot more money now on Beatport. Beatport what, is, like so, something like Spotify? Spotify, yeah. Spotify is our biggest uh, revenue generator by a long way. For you personally, and then for well, the tour label, room. For tour room, yeah, yeah. We, we you know, we do what, eight million streams a week, ten million. Streams so a every week. release from tour room, you will get like a cut, which you, as the company, keeps, and then you will dish out some to the. Yes, that's right. The we, DJ. Yeah, that's right. We, we, there's there's a percentage split between mm -hmm. label retention and, and artist. So yeah, and and the the main thing is where this industry tends to go wrong is there's too many record labels, not enough record companies, and and no one really gets paid. And, but where where we have paid everyone since yeah. day one, every single penny they're owed. Because if we, hey, look, if I don't pay you, how can I go back and say, can I have another one? You're going to say, no, yeah, you get a bad no reputation chance. as well. Yeah, no chance, Mark. But there's so many record labels that don't adhere to that, and it's it's a shame because um, that doesn't help the support the yeah. scene at all. I have a question for you guys. Do you take supplements? And if you do, do you really know what supplements you should be taking? You see, this is a problem I had for years. I would walk into a supplement store, I would buy loads of random bottles of supplements and just pop pills every day hoping for the best. But in reality, I had no idea whether or not I should be consuming these supplements. That is where Bionic came into the picture and solved that problem. You see, I've been working with Bionic for the past couple of years and since 2021, I've been getting my blood work done with them every three to four months. And based on that blood work, they send it off to get analyzed and then they put together a very 
specific customized formula for me, which will last me for three to four months until I get my next blood work done. And honestly, it's been an absolute game changer for me. They also offer another product called Bionic Go, where all you need to do is go onto the website, fill in questionnaire, and then based on that questionnaire, they can give you your customized supplements. So if that sounds like something that would be of interest, which I highly recommend, go onto the website, bionic.com, and you can use the link in my description to get a nice little discount on your first order. I was going through YouTube last night because I was I was curious to know like what bangers are actually from Tool Room. So I went on the YouTube channel and I arranged it as like the, from the most popular views. I think the the one that has the most views, 14 million, Technasia and Green Velvet Sugar. Sugar, yeah. 14, and then 7 million and 5 million, you got, what's his name, Weiss? Weiss, yeah, Weiss, yeah, yeah. Feel My Needs. Yeah. That is like my anthem for Ibiza, I think. It's such a, oh, it's such a great song. record, yeah. I mean, both of those records, when you talked about for like, I wouldn't have said they would have grown to be the records. They were real surprise records. I mean, Feel My Needs is still going. I mean, that's the record that's probably made us the most money ever, that. Really? Yeah. yeah. And then Slash and Dope, oh, yep. that uh, Anguilla. Well, yeah, I do you know. 3.4 million views for that one. Okay. But that's a banger though. The steel drums are... Yeah, I mean, missing. that's just on on our channel. I mean, a lot of people, you'll go to a lot of other sites that, you know, that have used our music. Well, there's, there's one with yours, uh, Your Love. The yeah. original club mix, 14 million views on some random channel. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that again, that, that that's quite you, a bit of ad revenue money, that. Absolutely, yeah. And, and it, it's our we, job uh, as the record label to be across all that, to find all that money, again, to pay the artists. That's what a record company does. Mm. We have to be across every opportunity to generate money for the artists. Go and collect that money, have relationships, have accounts with all these these platforms so that we can, you know, look after the artists. So even if that's on another channel, you still get the ad Correct. revenue from yeah, it? Yeah, we do. Okay. And then you've got a few of the ones, obviously Downpipe, Cody, I feel it, Into My Life, and Man With The Red Face. You know, I was I was wondering that you've got the uh, one which I, I used to listen to a lot, the Sandcastles, and you've got the love, that Florence and the Machine remix. Yeah. Why is that not on Spotify? It's clearance. Should, um, it's a good question. It's Florence and Machine. Because we licensed that, and in fact, the reason how we did that record um, was to generate revenue. We all the profits we gave to that. Um, at the time when that happened, there was a big tsunami in, in Japan. Mm. Um, and my friend, my wife's best friend, is Florence's manager, um, and she's known Florence forever and ever. In fact, when Florence was starting, my wife used to drive around to do all pub gigs in South London. Mm. Um, and we were just chatting. I said, we should probably do something about this. I said, look, what, give me the parts to You Got the Love and I'll do I'll do something with it. And we um, and we gave all the proceeds to the, the tsunami appeal in, in Japan. So I think that's probably a licensing thing because we just licensed the the parts off of, uh, I can't remember if it's Sony or whoever, to do that. So maybe they've not re-uploaded it, which is a shame. Cause it is a shame because that needs to be on my playlist. It, it, yes, I can't I'll, I'll look into that. <laughs> How do you ever find you have issues with licensing? If you maybe you heard some vocals from like an old song and you were like, oh, I want to use those vocals yeah. in this modernized house track yeah. that I want to do, you have to get permission from them Correct. to use the vocals. Yeah. And then they might say, yes, no, maybe. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that um, Alex Wan, he had a hit last year, that, the Milkshake song yeah. with Khalees. And I think they were in. I don't, well, clearly it wasn't on Spotify for a while but I think now Khalees has been like okay yeah you can use the vocals and then yeah. now it's on Spotify and then she must I assume get a cut Correct. from the revenue that yeah, that's yeah, yeah 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 no you have to do it. a lot of labels don't do that but because we're so present and we're so vocal that we can't we, you know, and it's not ethically it's not the right thing to do you know if someone was to go and sample my work and not pay me I'd be a little bit pissed off. I'm not going to lie. So, yeah, we go through the process. We've got um, a, a business affairs team in the office that, mm. um, that look after that. If someone uses a sample, we'll then get approach um, the people who own the sample. Um, and then there's two there's two halves of a record. So you've got the the master side, which is the actual audio. So let's say you sung a song and I wanted to sample it. That's great. Love that, Mark. I'm going to sample, but you didn't write it. They Jasper wrote it, right? Oh. So I'd have to go to you or whoever owns 
the uh, the master site, what we call the master site, the audio, and say, is it okay we can use it? And you're like, yes, you can. It's, it's 10 grand to use it and you pay us this royalty. Right? Then I've got to Jasper and say, can we clear the publishing side? And he'll then then he'll take a percentage. So there's two parts of a record. Mm. Um, and again, so it can get pretty expensive. It can get very expensive. It's better off just finding someone to do the vocals in the studio. Correct, Amundo. That is yeah. the. But we that the kind of view on that has changed a lot because initially it was like, no, we don't want to do it. It's loads and loads of money. But now people realise that it's a great way of reinventing them as an artist. Yeah. My, it's a great way to generate money without doing anything. You know, people have become less obst obtrusive in terms of their position on clearing things and more more open to doing things. Some people are pretty, you know, are pretty hardcore about it. It's a straight no. A lot of time, they'll, or they'll say, I'll take 100% and they're in every right to because mm. if, if it's their piece of music, you know, you can be like that. But it's become easier to clear samples now than it was back in the day. Back in the day was just a process that could could take years. You know, if there was 10 people writing a record, you had to go to them and say someone had died. Then you had to go to their estate. It was long. Yeah. It was a very, very long process. It's a lot more streamlined now and people are more receptive to that as a concept. Talking about songs coming back, you know that, um, that viral video of, I think it was Mustafa, Who's doing that dance when he gets out of the car? It's Friday, yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. And it's, like that made it so popular again. Oh, I mean that that record in in so many different iterations. Um, when did that the original the come original out? come out? And I'm going to say 1994. Um, it was now this the, okay. This, this is a story for us. So MK Mark Kitchen. That's a remix of, of a Scottish band called Nightcrawlers. Mm -hmm. That um, even that melody is not in the, the original. He wrote that as part of the remix. And that blew up. So I don't think Mark, apart from his uh, initial remix fee, has ever seen a penny more. That's when you remix it, this is the, this is, you know, the, the, the issue that it can be, unless you negotiate um, some element of publishing, which is tough to do on a remix. But that has blown up so many times and made the original Nightcrawlers band so much money. I mean, I guess they paid him, I have no idea, Mark, you probably hit me up and let me know. Let's say they paid him three grand back in the day, which is a lot of money. That's made them millions mm -hmm. because they own it. They own the master side, they own the master and the publishing side of it. You've just done a brilliant job of spinning it, but we own the original piece of music. That so. is mental. That has been, uh, and that record has been sampled so many times. They, that was a great piece of A&R skill commissioning that remix, oh let me tell way. you, for the band. What, because um, you've done a few remixes and obviously a lot yeah. of artists do remixes. What, why would you want to remix an existing song instead of just going off and doing your own song? It's a fair point. Sometimes there's a record you just love um, and you think, do you know what, I can, I can spin this in a way that makes sense. That has to be the driver of taking on a project. You think, hey, will this fit into my life? So is mm -hmm. this something something I can add to this project? I mean, you again, you people end up doing remixes for almost mercenary. They go, I'm going to pay this amount of money. And you think there's no way with the component parts in this record, you can do something in line mm. to uh, what to you stand make, for musically. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I mean, I've just re, uh, remixed Curtis Mayfield, Move On Up. So when you get asked to remix a record that's a classic like that, they're just they're golden opportunities or, or things you just think, do you know what? Yeah, I can just move, elevate this record or move it into another space that would have a different audience and make sense for me. It complements what I do. So are you, yes, are you it, getting asked to do it? Yeah, you, yeah, you get asked to do it. Yeah. So, so you you don't? Is it a bit of both? Like yeah, you might I'm, like a song and be like, that I can make it better and put my spin on it and then you get other people saying hey do you want to remix my song yeah you you get like for example so, well, we commission mixes all the time we'll have mm. a record and we're like in its original format <coughs> it does this but we think it would translate with, mm. with the parts into also this world so we'll go look can we pay you to do something in your style so it dances at that party and dances at that party and, and, and therefore generates more exposure for the record and more revenue opportunities mm. um where you take a record outside of, you know, oh, I love this Gene Kahn record. I'm going to just remix it. You can then go back to the label and say, look, I've done this. Would you pay me? Or then you can go to them and say, look, I've sampled it 
it's now my production. Would you clear the Would you clear the the sample? So they're they're two mm. different kind of things. But um, yeah, I got you know I get asked to do remixes all the time, and you can't do too many because it, it does rob you of a lot of inspiration. I remember when I initially started as an artist, I was so skint. Um, I ploughed every penny I had into into the studio. Um, we had to take on a load of remixes. Me and my partner at the time, Martin, when we worked together, um, we did about twenty remixes in a row one year, and it just killed us. They were brilliant. I mean, they were brilliant. We did sandcastles. We did a whole bunch of stuff that massively elevated our profile because we piggybacked on bigger eyes mm. um, and therefore give us more exposure. But we then came to do our own record. We're like, fuck, there's nothing left. <laughs> We've given it, all of our best ideas were given away. There's nothing in the tank. And it uh, it, it it made us and broke us all in one go. So remixes are, it's about just picking the moments within your kind of release schedule to say, okay, there in the year, I could go and do a remix. I could go and do something. You know, I've got a gap in my productions. But primarily, it's, uh, you know, I think it's better to mm. concentrate on your own productions. You, there's more longevity with with content that you own yourself i can imagine it is um it's a great way to build your own following and awareness if you can if you can already find a very popular track and somehow work your magic and make it even better yeah for sure then boom like you're you know you everybody that's fuck right. remix that like shit yeah oh absolutely if you pick the right thing and you do you add the magic to it then yeah that's a it's a quick win mm. Where's your favourite clubs in the world to play at? Oh, Where have wow. been the best? Um, I mean, I love playing in Bulgaria. I'm not going to lie. I love playing out there. It's unbelievable. I love playing in America and Canada, North anywhere in North America at the moment. I, I'd probably say there right now. I mean, the scene's so hot and boy, and it's, it's incredible. It's like it was here in the late 90s, early 90s. There's that amount of enthusiasm and passion. It's still growing. Is that, a re is that a recent thing in America? Yeah, in the last ten years, it's really just blown up, yeah. and it's still you know it's still going. There's still huge cities in America that really haven't got a scene yet that are still that are going to happen. So there's so much potential there. You know, there was always that old saying: if you're a band, just you know, if you make it in America, you make it because yeah. you can. You know, you, I, I could stop playing anywhere else in the rest of the world and just play in America and just have a career playing city to city to city because it's so big mm. and i have to say the enthusiasm out, enthusiasm out there is brilliant where it's a little bit tainted here it's become a bit tribal and a more about image than the love of music i have to say where they still uphold that as a as a real passion and mm. a real driver it's a great place to go and play who are the djs at the moment who you like sort of respect the most have the most admiration for i guess Carl Cox, just because he's, you know, he's such a nice guy and he's just stood behind his thing through thick and thin, you know. Mm. And I've got massive respect for that. Uh, he, again, another guy who does things purely driven by love. Every, you can just, you can see, you can feel that about his energy. Everything is passion driven. And again, the same thing with Louis Vega. He's, you know, he's very much in vogue now, rightfully so. I mean, he's been doing it for 25, 30 years, stood behind what he stood for forever and ever and absolute master of it so i guess i guess those guys mm -hmm. um the one thing you don't get to do enough of and it's wrong really is see other artists play because you're you're so busy doing your own thing and then you've got to try and balance it with life and mm. family and other things you don't really get the opportunities to go and see enough people when you get a career and, and that's wrong really because you need to go and pick up that inspiration that i guess that's the one failing in me is that i don't go and see enough artists play mm. and get inspired by them um it gets tougher when you get older and you've got family you've got responsibilities you've got, you know, got a bunch of businesses as well mm. that take up a lot of my time but um yeah so i'm i'm, I'm probably not the best in the world to answer that question but louis and carl for does, me does carl because he had the residency at space yep. in ibiza and then space uh changed to high yep. new ownership and then because of that did he stop yeah, yeah he had a very he was very tight with pepe uh the guy who owned space i don't know the the, the full politics behind it but there's a lot of weird politics i mean welcome to our beat <laughs> you know who know who understands that good luck i'm, um, I'm looking to try and speak to jan 
Right, Jan's a great... They're, I mean, look, they're some really great guys doing really great jobs. And, and Jan particularly, what they've done with that is, you know, brought clubbing into the, the, the next generation, fair play to them, mm -hmm. um, kept the island alive and buzzing and moving forward. So I've got a lot, a I, lot of time. I feel like respect. playing in boss has been almost transformed. Like yeah. just from High and then Ushuaia, and then he's opened uh, Player Soleil. Yeah. Like you, you can just feel it's uh, getting a makeover. Absolutely, and you know what they're going to do with privilege now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Bought that, so you know respect Fucking to those hell. guys. Yeah, yeah. Pri privilege. It was the biggest club on the island. Oh man, yeah, Matt. Like you know, played there a bunch of times. Yeah, when it's packed, it's mad. Fuck. So I mean, yeah, it'd be. I'm going to try my best. He's. I was speaking to him last year. But he's extremely busy. He's so a very he's, busy I, man. I need between, to catch him in the summer months before, like Absolutely. April. Winter's your time for Yan and those guys. Yeah. Who um, in the do you know like in the DJing world who is like the best paid DJ? Oh, probably David or Tiesto, I'd say. Still or, Tiesto. Yeah, and oh. Tice loves it, man. Again, someone love top top guy. Again, mm -hmm. he I've never met anyone who's so who loves DJing so much. He would play every day, three hundred sixty five days of the year <laughs> if he could, and because uh, uh, he just loves it. I mean. He, you know he's ne he's not this getting Tiesto or David T Tiesto, Tiesto yeah. yeah he just loves it yeah. good luck to him man when you're you're DJing this is one thing I was always curious to know about because I thought at one point oh maybe I could be a DJ and then I used to see the lifestyle and the hours that they would have to play like that would completely screw up with my sleep routine my <laughs> gym routine like how I'm assuming you the majority of the time now you're DJing sober. Like, did he used to well, get... You know, <laughs> let's not kind of box that into a statement like that. You know what I mean? Um, no, I'll pick and choose my moments, of course. Um, but I I don't play that much anymore now. I I play once or twice a month, and that, that works for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the measure of success isn't playing 18 times a month. In fact, quite the, the quite opposite. Um, we have so many issues with mental health in our industry and that's i think the biggest driver of that mm -hmm. that we've fashioned this this scenario that success means you're playing three times a weekend it really doesn't it really doesn't mean that because mm. it will it will kill you it will eat you up spit you out and you're, and you're just you. surrounded by all these people who are no doubt saying like, come on, time to go to the after party now. All of the above, you know, because you've flown the other side of the world. They want to give you a great time. You've got to catch a flight at six o'clock in the morning and do the same thing for the next two days. It's a very dangerous world built on a, on a, on a ridiculous foundation. So I only DJ two, three times maximum. Mm -hmm. And that's great. That works for me. I really look forward to it. I can balance my life. You know, I can be healthy. I can go and have fun, enjoy it. You know, it's life. Winning in life is when you do all the things you love in the right amounts. Yeah, balance. You know, balance. That's winning. Yeah. Winning isn't playing 18 times a month. That's killing yourself. Yeah. I mean, I, I can see why some of the artists are doing it. Like, you know, black coffee, people like that. They're getting flown to all these places in private jets. They're probably getting like hundreds of thousands of dollars a set. Like there is it would, that. It would be like <laughs> that helps. It's hard to because I was trying to think if I was in their situation. You know, you get to you get to do something you love to do. Just play music to thousands of people. Yeah, for a lot of fucking money. So <laughs> that you, you, it's like you're constantly getting all these offers because it's a big world. There's yep. a lot of clubs. Absolutely. How do you? It's like ah, oh, three hundred grand. Like. I kind of just want to chill with my on family. Tuesday, <laughs> go on then. <laughs> um, absolutely. Look, I was there, like pre my son, and when he was very young, I was there. You know, I was doing thirty gigs in August. But the older you get, the more you realise there's so much to life. Yeah. You know, life isn't just about doing one thing because you come that narrow as a person. Mm. You know, I've I've always been more than that, and it's. I, I remember being a club promoter, and you just you're surrounded by. There's definitely a specific type of people, and it is a bit narrow. Not, and a, yeah, yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not the healthiest environment. You know, we all like, can all fill in the blanks. Um, so I think there's a time and a place to turn that on. And I think if you can work your career to a point where you can afford yourself that as an opportunity, and then I think it's wise to do so. I mean, it's taken me a while to 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 get to that point, but I was always striving for that. I mean. The big thing I always worried about getting into it was like, how do I get out of it? 
Mm. It's all going in. It's all good fun then when you're, you know, 25, 26, running around the world. How do I get out? And how do I get out gracefully? Like, no one wants to see the heavyweight boxer going and getting his head bashed in every week. Yeah. No one wants to see the DJ falling off the cliff, playing awful gigs when they had such great profiles. So I built the label alongside it as my exit strategy, as my plan B. Always had a plan B because that's smart. And I'm like, now I don't need financially to DJ. Yeah. I don't need I do it because I love it again. And that, that puts me in a great place. I don't do it because I've got to pay the rent. I do it because I'm really looking forward to playing in New York next week. Mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to going to LA. Not only am I doing something I love, I'm going somewhere great in the world, and I'm enjoying it. And I'm back, I feel I'm, I've, I've kind of fallen in love with it again because you know, it does come a point, like anything, you become numb to it. You mm -hmm. know, that, that, that impact, you lose it. Like a lot of my friends are ex-premiership players and rugby players and you say to them do you miss the game they're like no like, what no how can you you get to a point where you play so many games yeah. that walking out on, to Am at Anfield loses its thing and I never wanted DJing to become that there were moments where like well I'm done I'm done now I've said everything I need to say um, and it's too much. It's too mm. much to cope. The pressures of it, the the balancing of your family and getting that right, which is, you know, fundamentally number one. Um, and then, you know, I just, I said, well, you know, I don't need, just back it off. Yeah. Just back it off. Like, uh, and, you know, be, enjoy being present. I, you know, I, most of my time is spent with my son and my family, running him around all over the country playing football. And that's that's the most important thing to me right now. And then I DJ for fun. Yes, I get paid. And I yes, I get to maintain the exposure I need to uphold my job within the label. Um, but it's gone back to a place of where it began, of just fun. Mm. Not a slog that is in line with the hamster wheel of the rest of the industry, feeling like I've got to do 27 gigs this month to be relevant. Oh, I ain't. Yeah. You can, you can be more selective and then it, it makes it more special, not only for you, but obviously the people in attendance as well. Yeah, I, I think so. But even if it doesn't, it works for me. Yeah. And I'll go into that environment in a good place, ready to smash it, you know, mm. not hanging at my ass, tired. Um, yeah, ima imagine I was trying to, going to like your set and you don't start till one or two in the morning the and end. you're already knackered. Oh, man. You're like, fuck, I've got to do a five six hour set it's great look listen it's i'm not digging up the road mate i mean there's a lot of people who do a lot harder things than me and i, you know, I don't want to start moaning because that would be the wrong but every job has its graph mm. every job has its challenge and that sleep deprivation um it is is massive and especially when you're trying to run a business in line with that you know because i i always want to lead from the front i'm the captain of the team i've got to put captains performance in mm -hmm. don't matter if I'm playing in Sao Paulo on Saturday night I've got to be the first in the office Monday morning Yeah, because if I can't how am I going to expect that not to and if that's a standard I set that if I can be there you live 20 minutes down the road don't be late <laughs> yeah. don't be late I'll have the kettle on but don't be late you know what I mean and we, we created that culture and uh, the people that work in my office are just incredible. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, where I am at because of my team. You know, it, there's no eyes. It's, it's, it's we and it's the team. But it's about setting that precedent of, of, of the standards you expect. And mm. look, we play hard. We play really hard, but we, and we work hard. And then we live life to the fullest. So, so um, yeah. How, how big is the team now? Thirty-three. Nice. Yeah, uh, and they're all incredible. They, they are. You know, I'll, I'll die for them. They're, they're brilliant. Mm. The HQ in London. The HQ's in Maidstone in Kent. Okay. Um, so we're we're based out there. But um, props to the team; they're brilliant. Yeah. What have uh, you got coming up in twenty twenty four? Any big gigs? You're looking forward yeah, to? Yeah, we've got a whole. Uh, yeah. Um, in terms of the label, what, what, I guess the next big thing we've got a big pool party in Miami at WMC. That'd be great. We do one every year there. I need to go to that before oh. I get too old. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never get too old for Miami. Let me tell you. Um, do you feel like the 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 crowd there is a little bit older because sometimes when I go to when you are like selective with the nights that you go to say for example in Ibiza you can find a lot of people like same age as me even older like there's nights that have the old crowd there's nights that have the younger crowd yeah 
Oh, we, li listen, we're living through a very interesting time right now um, in the evolution of electronic music because we are going through, uh, in my eyes, the next phase of it. We had everyone, because I'm a little bit older than you, when we used to go mm. out back in the day, a lot of my friends stopped going out because we all had kids and, you know, settled down. They're like, well, look, I'm 50 and I, I'm not ready to jack, you know, mm. I'm not, don't need slippers and a pipe and an old people's home. <laughs> I've, I've still got a bit in the locker, mate. Uh, and you've got all these the hips still move they still go oh, okay it's just the third hip I've had but, you know what I mean um, there are nights now that are relative to certain age group which is great because why should it end why does it need to yeah. end when you're 40 yeah. or 50 why should it you know it's um, I guess it's about being comfortable in the environment you're in but yeah I mean there, there's some there's some nights that are uh, uh, yeah, I guess for an older crowd out there Loads and lo lots of kids there, which are great because it mm. continually moves the scene on. Mm. It's brilliant. And like I say, the enthusiasm, enthusiasm in, in, in uh, America is off the charts. Mm. So that's good. Then we've got shows in LA, Vancouver, Boston, uh, New York, Bali. A big show in London on the 15th of May, is it? Something like that. Yeah. Uh, ministry. So yeah, yeah, we've always got loads going on. It's always There's always something happening. Is that in is, is in Savaya, the one in Bali? It is at Atlas. Okay. Um, which we did one there just before um, Christmas. was brilliant. It's enormous there, by the way. What a place yeah. that is. Is that? It's funny because as I've got older, I still I still like to go to a party. I definitely drink less because I can't hack that anymore. But I I really appreciate like the daytime parties and the early evening ones where it yeah. kind of finishes at twelve like one. You are getting old, mate. I Do know. You know what I mean, can you get Mike a bit of a cut blanket? He's getting a bit chilly <laughs> now as well. No, you go out true. with a Zimmer frame. <laughs> it's true. That's become a thing now, which is great. I mean, it, it's just new iterations and evolutions. Day parties in London are the biggest thing at the moment. We're doing a big daytime show at Coco in October. Which is great again because mm. you are done by twelve, by sometimes ten o'clock. Which is brilliant. You're yeah. Back for match of the day. <laughs> Everyone's a winner. Speaking of football, you 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 start a new business venture. I have yes. Yeah. Segue nicely into that. Um, yes, it's called Ballers. Um, it's a project that um, I've started with um, some ex, uh, some footballers, Bobby, uh, some more Rio Ferdinand, Mark Noble, um, mm -hmm. and some really uh, and a guy called Nick and Danny. It's um, it's first sight is at Blue Water which is just outside of town. It's a, it's a football experience. Um, it's kind of multifaceted experience. It's a huge dome. Um, it's got a seven-a-side pitch. Um, and when you play on the pitch, you've got all big screens around it, so you get real-time playbacks of your goal. You oh. come out of the, the tunnel to the music. When you score, uh, all the effects um, go, all the lights go off. Um when you finish, you get all your highlights emailed to you. You get a heat map of what you've done, all your stats. Um, so it's kind of like football on steroids. And then indoors, you've got a skill zone where we've got a target wall. We've got head tennis. We've got all this incredible tech, these brilliant football games. So um, we are running it to sort of facilitate football at every level. In the daytime, we've got little kickers, little ballers, should I say. Mm -hmm. um, we've got walking football, we've got community staff, we've got special needs staff. Um, we have then got local football, we run our own academy out of there. And then at weekends, it's for parties, party, you know, hire it for a party, kids parties, you come in, you do a bit in the skill zone, you go out on the pitch. It's incredible. We get a chance, look up, um, go to our Instagram page, Ballers. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's very exciting. It's brilliant. The, I mean, this is the first one's going to be in London? First site opens um, in May, on the 17th of May. Um, really excited for that. Um, we're already in talks with two other venues as well, nice. two other sites, um, which is great because I'm finally doing the two things I always wanted to do, football and music. So nice it's exciting. It's um it's great to to take all the, the kind of acumen and understanding you've got through business in one world and then transfer it into mm. something else and then again in something you're massively passionate about. So I'm loving every minute of it at the moment. Is it Rio Ferdinand's involved with that as well? Yeah, Rio's involved, Bobby nice. and Mark and yeah, and, and big up to Nick and Danny as well and Parker and Ben and all the guys are are making it work. But and uh, Sam as well, great team behind that, brilliant team all top lads and top projects. It's so excited for it to, to launch and um, people to come and see it because it is a f uh, of one of a kind. Nice, man. Thanks, Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, mate. And, Thank um, you for having me. Everyone can find you 
just search for DJ Mark Knight at DJ Mark Knight yeah all the same all Instagram Twitter all that stuff is yeah. all just the same yeah come on uh, follow me running around the world doing stuff and buy the songs from Correct. Tool Room stop downloading illegally there's one thing you're going to take away from that uh, today hopefully it's that because like, it just it helps emerging talents it helps us st- scene if you're a fan of music then you know just do the right thing subscribe to Spotify or Apple it's pittance and you've got let listen you've got every record ever made not a bad mm-hmm. deal and uh, check out my playlist as well I Be The House Music 2024 absolutely <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much brilliant Mark. thanks Mark nice one mate